here is the first thing I'd like to say, and thank you for taking time out of your day uh, with us. Oh, good. Testing, one, two, three, good. Okay. Um, thank you is what I'd like to say to you uh, to, for being here today, taking time out of your day, trying to learn a little bit more about your own health. Um, February is a great time. It's February 1st now, so we all think about Valentine's and the heart, and so this is a great thing, I think, that we can talk about here today. Um, and uh, one of the things I want to ask you, I, I kind of want to poll the audience here real quick. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you personally know someone who has had a heart attack before? And i got to raise my hand too, so not from my job, but just from people that I know. Okay, great. And then if you don't mind sharing the information, if it's too personal, that's okay. But how many people in this audience have had a heart attack before that wouldn't mind raising their hand? Great. So when we've got people here who have survived this and have come through. So um, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Um, and uh, there's so much to learn about the heart. And obviously I can't teach you in just this few short period of time that we have together. But I hope that by the end of this that you feel like you've gained something from this. That you feel like you can help yourself or your loved one uh, to learn a little bit more about how you can recognize the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So let's get into it here. Um, so I won't riddle this with too many words here, but I just kind of want to hit the high points here. So about over 600,000 people die of heart disease in the United States every year. That's one in every four deaths in this country is related to heart disease. If you can consider drug overdoses and car crashes and everything else that happens, one in four of those deaths can be attributed to heart problems. Um, and it's the leading cause of death in men and women, and uh, men outweigh the women a little bit more. Uh, that was the latest statistics back in 2009. And the most common type of heart disease is coronary heart disease, and every year about 735,000 people have a heart attack. And 525,000 of those are a first heart attack, and 210,000 happen in people who have already had a heart attack. So long story short, the numbers are big in, in the United States. So, all right, what's well, one of the only instances when an Alabama man wouldn't really care for the color crimson? Okay, and I, it's a little bit of a joke there. I'm a Mississippi State alumnus, but I, I want to say that having moved to Alabama, I've lived here for a little bit over three years now, the first questions I was asked when I moved here was, who are you for? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? Well, who are you for? You know what I'm talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, all from Alabama. I'm like, no, I'm stepping away from that one. <laughs> We're good. So one of the only times you wouldn't care for it would be this. So um, that's meant to look like a crimson color, but the really dark crimson color is basically the heart disease death rates from adults ages 35 and up by county in the United States. Look at Mississippi, look at Alabama, look at the Southeast in general. Uh, it's, it's huge. And so we are in that, right? We're right in the middle of that here. So um, it's something we definitely need to keep our eyes and ears attuned to. Okay. So here's our risk factors, all right? So we think about high blood pressure. We think about high cholesterol. We think about smoking. Those are some of our key risk factors. Half of Americans have at least one of these factors, at least one, and many of us have more than one. Um, other medical conditions that can put us at higher risk for heart disease include diabetes, and for me, diabetes is number one on the list. Um, so if you have or know someone who has diabetes, it's something to strongly consider, especially if you smoke or have any of the other ones like high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So think about that one. Um, overweight and obesity, and I think that we, we understand that one, I think, right? Because of the, the condition that our body is in, we're not in good physical health when we're overweight or obese. Um, poor diet, which leads to overweight and obesity. Um, physical inactivity, which can be related to all of that as well. And then excessive alcohol use. And the reason for that is when you drink excessive alcohol, you have an increased storage of fat in your body, and which, where does that fat store itself? It stores itself in what we call the visceral organs, which can include your heart. So we need to be considering those things um, we intake alcohol excessively. 
All right, so what is coronary artery disease anyway? So basically this little picture shows plaques here. So it's caused by plaque buildup in the wall of the arteries that supply the blood to the heart called the coronary arteries. Plaque is made up of cholesterol deposits and that buildup causes the inside of the arteries to narrow over time, over time and this is called atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis in and of itself is bad, but it's not the worst thing. The biggest thing is that, that being overweight and the physical inactivity and the diabetes, it causes you to have things called inflammatory markers on there, and it makes the other parts of your blood cells stick to it. And when that sticks to it, then you're setting yourself up for having a heart attack. All right, so early action is important. So we need to know the warning signs of a heart attack. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And uh, a survey was done that showed that 92% of people recognized that chest pain was a symptom of a heart attack, but only 27% of people were aware of all the major symptoms and knew to call 911 when someone was having a heart attack. And 47% of, of sudden cardiac deaths occur outside a hospital, which means, you know, if, if almost half of this is occurring outside of the hospital, we need to know what to do when we're on that front line out there, when we're not in a hospital setting, we're not around a healthcare provider. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to learn how to act on those early warning signs. <clears throat> so here's some of our major warning signs. Chest pain or discomfort. All right, we think we know that one. Upper body pain or discomfort in the arms, back, neck, jaw, or upper stomach. So. Doc, I'm hurting right here. I don't know. I don't know if it's gas, but I'm just hurting right here. Um, Doc, I'm just hurting in my jaw, but I don't have any tooth pain, but it just feels like it's hurting in my jaw up here. Or, or my neck's just hurting right here, and that, that's all that's going on. Or Doc, I'm just hurting like right between my shoulder blades right here, and it just feels very uncomfortable to me. I just can't get comfortable. So those are some things I've heard from patients who are actually having either a heart attack or something related to that who come to see me in the emergency department. So. Not trying to scare you, and of course, everything you feel, not, not every neck pain, you know, jaw pain is a heart attack, right? But we just need to be cognizant that those are some of the risk factors. Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is a very big one. So sometimes we can have shortness of breath and not necessarily have chest pain, and it can be an attributing factor to us having an early warning sign of a heart attack. And then nausea, lightheadedness, cold sweats, there's a, just a big mixture of, of uh, symptoms you could potentially have with this. All right, so when should we call 911? Call 911 if you have crushing, squeezing, tightening pressure in your chest. Um, the pain spreads to your jaw, like we talked about, shoulder blades, arm, nausea, dizziness, sweating, racing heart, shortness of breath. So all those things we talked about before, you, it would be a good idea to get, get seen soon for that. Um, Anyone here familiar with, some people pronounce it differently, angina or angina. Um, some people in this audience might have even been diagnosed with that. So if you have known angina or angina, and then you suddenly start to have worsening of that, that's another risk factor. Or um, you have sudden sharp chest pain with shortness of breath, especially if you were taking a long trip, anybody got in the RV and drove up to North Dakota or something like that, and then the trip's over, you're starting to feel really short of breath. We start worrying about you being immobilized and having a blood clot in your legs that may have potentially gone into your lungs. So it might not necessarily be a heart attack per se, but you're having a very a serious condition that needs to be addressed in an emergent setting. Okay, so what would we do if you came to see us in the emergency department? Or if you called 911 and the paramedics came out to see you? So we're going to, we're going to check your blood pressure, your heart rate, your breathing rate, your temperature, your oxygen levels of your blood. You might get an EKG, you might get a chest x-ray, you might get some special blood tests to check the heart. Um, if appropriate, you would receive aspirin therapy, oxygen, nitroglycerin for chest pain if, if necessary, and even morphine to help relieve your symptoms. And if you are actively having a heart attack, you might receive further medications to help protect <coughs> in the blood of your heart to protect it, or see a cardiologist urgently or emergently and have a heart catheterization which means they take a catheter and go and basically take fancy pictures of the heart to see if there's something that they need to open up. And we talked about those coronary arteries being closed off like that, or closing off. All right, 
so what we can do in the emergency department to help treat you and take care of you, everything we talked about on the first slide, right before this, right? But also electrical cardioversion. So any of you have heard of the AED? We have basically a fancy AED in the emergency department, and there's different settings we can use to shock your heart if necessary. And there are certain heart conditions in which we would need to do that, and we can do that in the emergency department for you. Um, if necessary, intubation, which means a tube would be placed down your throat to help you breathe. Um, central line placement, which means you know nurses or doctors can put IVs in your arms, but this would be a bigger line if you need certain special medications to be given. Chest tube placement, depending on what kind of chest pain you have, you might actually need a chest tube, um, and that's for different heart and lung conditions. And then um, special medicines to change your blood pressure. And that would be usually given through that large central line we just talked about, too. All of this can be done in the emergency department setting. All right, so things you can do to avoid an emergency. Don't smoke. All right, those are the things you can do. And there's some things we have genetic factors that, we're, that we are predisposed to. We don't have a whole lot of control over. But stopping smoking is something that you can certainly control. And that's one of the first things I'd like for you to try if you, if you are a smoker. Maintain a healthy weight. So keep doing a good job. I understand lunch was great today and it's tasty, but it's a healthy choice. Um, there's lots of things we can do to, to have healthy choices when it comes to food. Uh, um, eating a healthy diet, so exercising regularly. And it doesn't have to be running marathons, right? It just has, it's us having activity, getting out there, moving those legs, moving those arms, getting, some, getting our heart rate up a little bit every day, doing something to make ourselves healthier. And then managing our high blood pressure, our cholesterol, and our diabetes if we have those conditions. And so following up with your doctor about that would be the right thing to do. All right, I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about something called hands-only CPR. How many of you have heard of hands-only CPR? Okay, so great, good, a lot of people in the audience. So <clears throat> hands-only CPR, the reason I wanted to introduce that to you is because some people feel very timid or very uncomfortable uh, with CPR someone uh, loses consciousness in front of them, maybe they're having a sudden heart attack um, and they don't know what to do except maybe call 911. But maybe there's some things you can do right there and they don't know how to do the breathing and when do we do this chest compression stuff. Um, so what you do is, um, when you first of all, you do you should call 911 if somebody does that in front of you. Um, be specific, they'll, they'll be able to find you and figure out where you are, answer their questions and then get, get back to your, your friend or the patient that's near you. So, <clears throat> anyone ever seen this movie? <laughs> Saturday Night Fever, very good. And uh, who is that guy? Right there? <laughs> very good. Um, I think they just did Grease Live on TV the other night. Too. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, great, great guy. So, what was the cadence to that song? Anyone heard the BG song, Staying Alive? Okay. So, um, can we pull that up? Let's see if we can. This is from the, I think it's from the American Heart Association. So, tell me, young man, do you remember what your dad and I taught you about hands-only CPR? Yes, uh, kind of. If you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, the first thing you do is... Call 911. And the second thing you do is... Push hard and fast in the center of the chest at a rate of at least 100 beats per minute. Who even knows what 100 beats per minute sounds like? Well, you can tell me Call 911. And push hard and fast in the center of the chest to the beat of staying alive until help arrives. Easy to remember, right? So um, I'll, I'll 
I'll have to add something here that when I was in training, I didn't learn it to the beat of staying alive. <laughs> I learned it to the beat of another one bites the dust, <laughs> which is the same cadence. But I think staying alive makes us feel a little better about it, right? So, uh, um, so we're going to go with staying alive. Now, did you notice something there? Um, can I get either Rich or Two to come up? Let's give a hand for one of our medical students here. Not all of you will be able to see this, but we're going to try our best. So. Rich is just going to lay down on the floor. Alright, the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you what you should do, okay? Because they're going to do this, right? But what you're going to do is, if you noticed on the video, they had their shoulders locked, okay? Because the, the temptation is to get down here, and I'm sorry if you can't see, but is to come back here and to do this. All right, you don't want to do this, okay? Get up over the patient, lock your arms, and then put your body weight on top of them, and then use the weight of your body to push down on the chest right in the center, okay? And then ha, 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 stay in the There we go. All right, let's see if there's any hands. So, I think we've, we've got that down pat, so, um, and then I want to talk a little bit about AEDs. So, AEDs are found um, throughout the community nowadays, so I, I believe we have AEDs here, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, and so, and they, they're in Walmart and all these other different large locations, so if someone does have a sudden uh, episode like this, <coughs> we can call 911 and get an AED and turn it on. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to use it. Okay, it has the pads on it. You place one on the front of the chest and on the side and turn it on and it, it starts to analyze the rhythm of the person's heart for you. And it will tell you whether or not they, it would advise to shock or not. It'll tell you exactly what to do. In the meantime, you're doing chest compressions for that patient, okay? So you're trying to help them, you're doing chest compressions, the AED is going to ask you to stop chest compressions to do its own monitoring of the heart rhythm. You're going to listen to it. It'll say shock advised, and it'll tell you to clear the patient, to, to not touch the patient anymore before it delivers a shock, or it, will, or it might say no shock advised, which would mean that you would continue chest compressions at that time. Okay. So um, the other thing I wanted to do is just open the floor up to any questions you might have, um, but otherwise that, that would just be the end of my talk. Alright guys, you've got questions, I'll try to get to you, or if you can speak loud, to, hold on a minute. It's my understanding that women really have <coughs> harder time surviving heart attacks than they have them, even though men may have them more often. Um, how does a woman with the less differentiated uh, symptomatology uh, determine when it's appropriate for her for her It's a great question. Um, so, what I would say is, when in doubt, err on the side of caution. Okay, because you might feel something that feels different for you, uh, and then when it starts feeling different for you then there may be something more to it. And then it's never a bad idea to go and get it checked out. Um, especially in the emergency department setting, a lot of times if the patient has chest pain, we tend to see those fairly quickly and we will get an EKG is one of the first things that we'll do. And we can go on from there and ask you some more questions and find out what your medical problems are, find a little bit more about the things we kind of talked about here to help us kind of carve a picture of, of who you are to help us in our diagnostics as well. Great question. Okay, any other questions? I have a question. Okay, okay. Like, I'll just come to the back of the room. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> when you have a family history of heart disease, and I'm talking about have a heart attack and it's over, that kind of heart disease, um, when do you advise someone, even if you're, even if you go to your general practitioner and they say, oh, you've got a good report. <coughs> you know, you know yourself that sometimes things do feel a little different from time to time. You know, when do you advise someone, 
uh, is there a particular age or anything, to come to, uh, to go to a specialist and say, you know what, we need to run some tests and, and let's find out where I am and have a plumb line to go by. Right. Great, great question. So you're, I think you're talking about sudden cardiac death or sudden, sudden cardiac arrest with a genetic component to it, right? Yeah. So it's inherited. Uh, and, and so those typically happen to people who are, in their, who are younger, uh, younger than our typical schema of things. So what I would say in those instances is you should at least be acquainted with, first of all, at least acquainted with your family doctor. The family doctor should definitely know the family history. And I would have a low threshold for that patient or for the family members with, those, with that history to have a follow-up visit with a cardiologist. And then and, and for any of those people who develop chest pain, I would rather them come to the emergency department at the time they're having pain to have us evaluate them for that. Otherwise, have a good, close relationship with your family doctor and maybe even a cardiologist. Do we have much different symptoms if you were having a stroke? Am I correct? It's called heart attack, but they're heart failure. So she asked if you would have different symptoms if you're having a stroke versus a heart attack. That's a great question. And Probably yes, because stroke symptoms are going to be more along the lines of difficulty speaking, facial droop, weakness, weakness of one side of the body, those kinds of things. But the good, the, the interesting thing you bring up there, all the risk factors we talked about today are the same risk factors for stroke. So if you control that, you're also going to lower your risk for stroke. And Alabama is a huge part of the stroke belt. So we didn't talk about stroke in detail today, but stroke's very important with that. Great question. So she asked if there's a medicine we can give in the emergency department for stroke if you get there within a certain amount of time of the onset of your stroke symptoms. And the answer to that is yes, maybe. And so yes, maybe means yes, if you get there within four hours of the symptom onset and you're not having a hemorrhage and you haven't had a bunch of other things on a list of things that we go over a checklist then you become a candidate for that drug, and it's a clot-busting drug. Yes, that's right. All right, we have another question here in the back. Oh, um, I'm told by a chiropractor guy that the single most important exercise anyone can do is leg kicks. He said, because as you age, gravity pulls everything down, your heart, your liver, your kidneys. He said a lot of times when people die or get sick from any of those, it's because they're displaced. It's not so much because they're diseased. He said leg kicks keep your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your bladder, everything up in proper work and order. Mm -hmm. So he said that's the number one single exercise everybody needs to practice, but people don't even talk about it. So why is that? If it's so important, why is people don't even tell us about that? Tell like stand on the door face and just kick back, <laughs> kick back. Reputations on each leg. Tell me about the leg. Works. Tell me about the leg kicks and what is he? The, yeah, so like standing in a door face in like the bathroom, uh -huh. somewhere you can hold on, keep your back straight, kick forward, kick back on each leg. Repetitions. He said by the time you get up almost like halfway up, your chest will be sitting up firm, your heart will be in place, your liver, your kidneys, everything will be in proper working position. I said what? He said yeah. He said a lot of people don't be diseased. You know, it's not because they're high to have a disease or anything, because it's this place. You said gravity pulled everything down, even your insides. That's what he had told me. I didn't realize so it's a good they point. Have to exercise with your insides. What I would say to that is what they're encouraging you, the doctor's encouraging you to do a really good thing, and that's exercise. Yeah. And so the exercise in and of itself is going to speed up your heart rate, it's going to yeah. increase your physical activity, and that is going to be one of the things that's going to lower your risk factors for having a heart attack. It's one of them. So the other things are still important too. So I wouldn't say just that. We do need to uh, make sure we're keeping up with not smoking and you know okay. dietary and controlling diabetes if we have it, cholesterol, hypertension. Okay. Yeah. But the part up there that said exercise, though, I think a lot of people when you're thinking about jogging and running, walk around, blah blah, have to do all that. Just do something at home. <laughs> That's right. You, That's, sure, yeah. you can do exercises at home too, in, in your comfort of your home too. Okay. We have another one. You want to just stand up and we'll repeat oh. the question. Uh, well, I'm 33 and I have diabetes, um, mm -hmm. and, and I know sometimes like uh, I get pain in my shoulders. Is it not really in my chest? But do I probably just I don't know. I don't smoke or anything like that. But, mm -hmm. um, so you're wondering if you should. And so my you... mother died. She died yesterday of uh, 2013 of heart disease. So, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. 
So you bring up a really good point. So she's 33 years old, she has diabetes, but she doesn't really have a whole lot of other risk factors except a strong family history of heart problems. And then occasionally she gets shoulder pain, but not necessarily chest pain. So patients who have diabetes are gonna have an atypical patient. So they might not necessarily have the classical crushing chest pain radiating up into the jaw or into the left arm. Mm -hmm. They may have shoulder pain symptoms or something different. With their, along with their diabetes. So I think in your case, I think if, if you haven't already talked to your family doctor, I would do that first, and then they may want to schedule you for a, a stress test. That's what I would do. All right, we got time for one, maybe one or two other questions. You're okay right there? Yeah. Um, how do you know the difference between um, corporal tunnel pain and heart so very much. So she wants to know what the difference is between carpal tunnel pain and heart pain. And so a lot of times when we talk about the heart, we talk about it radiating into the arm, right? Well, carpal tunnel pain is usually going to be confined to this the carpal tunnel, which is right down here. So it really won't go anywhere other than this. Whereas pain in the arm that's related to the chest, typically, and I'm talking typically here, will follow it, a pattern of radiating pain into the shoulder or into the left arm from above, and not necessarily just the spot. Okay, right here. Yeah. Why, why do y'all do a stress test when you go in with our chirogram and you see more and you know more? Why do you not have a doctor who's going to skip that? If you see anything, they're going to do our right. chirogram anyway, so we just skip over the stress test. So she asked a really good, great question. Why I do the stress test at all? Why not just skip straight to the arteriogram? And the decision to do that is one that I don't make in the emergency department, so I'm probably not the best one to answer it. However, I would say that it's typically done by the heart and primary care doctors based off of what they think your risk factors are. And so if they think you're more lower risk, they'll typically start you with a stress test. If they think you're super high risk on the get-go, they may go straight to that. Um, or to a different, or maybe an echocardiogram of the heart or something like that. It's at the discretion of the, of the doctor that's involved in your care. You don't think you should be the patient, but really, you should be the patient. He was going to do the stress test, and I said, well, if the stress test comes back, what are you going to do? He said, oh, I'm going to do the stress test. I said, well, that's just so hard. There's no need to do it. What I love about that is the relationship that you have with your doctor. The ability to communicate. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid. It's your body. Don't be afraid to ask questions and get yourself out there and, and, and anything you're confused about or you don't feel is right, don't be afraid to ask. All right, guys, let's give Dr. Jason Stanford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much important information. And remember, uh, he is our medical director at the Coos Valley Medical Center. Uh, emergency department and if you roll in there we hope you don't have to but if you need to we want you to you may see him but he doesn't have to sleep I've, I've talked to him a little bit about that every once in a while so but he's got a great team of clinicians and other physicians that will be there to take care of you so remember that chest pain that's not that that's a, an emergency situation that's just not an urgent thing you know we see a lot of uh, new concepts out there, urgent care, dock in the box, you hear all that sort of stuff. But those kind of symptoms are not urgent, they are emergent. So please remember uh, that as you make decisions at your house, and, and, and don't do not me, try to Google it, get to the emergency room, call 911. So great program today. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for taking your time. And, and uh, also, thank you for choosing Coosa Valley Medical Center in our community to serve us. Thank you. Thank you. Commercial about our heart wall coming up. Now, you may want to enter the run, but the other night I went online and I just said, Oh, I better <laughs> enter the walk. So. <laughs> Uh, we are excited. February the 20th is coming up. Our sixth annual Heart and Soul uh, 5K in One Mile uh, is coming up. Like I said, February the 20th is right around the corner. So this is to benefit the cardiac and pulmonary rehab. So that is for those patients that have survived um, any type of heart or lung disease that have come through the program there at the hospital. Some of you guys, I think, have um, made it through that program maybe one, two, maybe three times. Or somebody that you know, whether at church or a neighbor, has come through that um, program here at the hospital. So this is to benefit that department. Um, and like the lady in the back said, um, that she just exercises. And like you heard the doctor say, it is 
real important for heart disease to really get out there and exercise. And while we all know that we are not 5K runners like myself, <laughs> uh, that is why we have the one.